probably should get started here. We're about on time. All right, so I will just say hello and, uh, and welcome to our Wednesday webinar presented by the TEA Western North America Division. Um, I'm Darren Brown. I'm on the Western Division Board and also Director of Product Engineering at Dynamic Attractions. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, bringing Boom to life. Boom is an immersive show experience that's at the Britannia Mine Museum located near Vancouver, Canada. So the creative and engineering team that developed the project uh, is gonna be sharing how they created a show that took an abandoned building at a real former mine site. Uh, they took information about how it was used to extract copper from ore and then wrapped that with an engaging story to give guests an, uh, an entertaining experience. So we can do that. Then after the, after the presentation, we'll also share some advice and lessons learned about how to develop projects and immersive entertainment in the museum and nonprofit space. So joining me today is uh, Darren Johnson. He's a site manager for the Britannia Mine Museum. We have Nancy Holm of Echo West Developments. Nancy's been the project manager for phase one and two of the development of the Mine Museum. We've got Randall Ormston of uh, Vista Collaborative Arts. He's a producer and creative director of Boom. And we also have David Lowe, executive vice president for Dynamic Attractions. So I'll also mention just as a bit of a plug that as kind of a companion piece to this presentation, uh, there's gonna be a live event at the Britannia Mine Museum on August 28th. So if you're in the Vancouver area or able to get here, uh, information should be published online quite soon about how to uh, get tickets for that. So feel free to post questions in the chat as we go. Um, and if we have time at the end, we'll try to pull some of those out and ask our panel members. Um, so let's get started. So we'll start with some background on the Britannia Mine Museum from the uh, museum's site manager, Darren Johnston. He's generously put his time aside on his vacation to join us. So Darren, can you tell us what is and where is uh, the Britannia Mine Museum? Yeah, for sure. Uh, thanks, Darren. Um, the Britannia Mine Museum, uh, we are located just north of Vancouver on the Sea to Sky Highway that leads from Vancouver proper uh, all the way to the resort town of Whistler. And Vancouver and Whistler, as many of you probably know, we hosted the 2010 Winter Olympics, uh, which were a big success and, and actually really helped the museum uh, directly. The museum has been in uh, continuous operation since 1975, and we sit on the site of the original mine processing facility of what's known as the Britannia Mine. On the museum, we host approximately 75,000 visitors a year, and about 12,000 of those are, are students from local schools in our, our very local area, as well as in from Vancouver, attending uh, our curriculum-based programming, which we're quite proud of. Uh, we are a private, not-for-profit society, uh, registered charity as well uh, here in Canada. And we are approximately, and it varies year to year, but about 95% self-funded through just regular admissions, people coming in the door, uh, and also through our membership program. The main building on our site is known as Mill Number no. Three. Uh, it's a National Historic Site of Canada. And upon uh, spending just a few moments inside this building on the lower floor, many of our visitors have consistently over the decades asked us two questions. What was it like to be in this mill while it was in operation? And also, what is it like up there now? Uh, very common questions. Uh, we set out to create an experience that answers these two questions. The planning for it started way back in 2012 um, with the initial creative concepts uh, and of course all the fundraising that goes along with that. Uh, production and construction uh, started in 2018 uh, and the exhibit itself opened in the summer of 2019. Uh, before we get to more details on the show itself, uh, I'd like to share a bit more background on the building and the evolution it has undergone since it was first built back uh, way back in 1923. Uh, first of all, you may be wondering why it's called mill number three. Well, it's called mill number three because there was two mills on the same site uh, prior to it. Uh, mill number one was deemed too small for the volume of ore and for the find, the, the ore find that they, they eventually realized was here. But the main reason it's called mill number three is because mill number two burned down in 1921 under mysterious circumstances. So they built uh, a third one. Mill number two was built of wood. Uh, mill number three, they decided to build primarily out of concrete and steel. The site where the mill sits is the former processing area of the mine, it's called the beach. And the underground mining support town uh, was further up the mountain on Mount Shear, and they simply called that the town site. 
Uh, mill number three ran continuously for 50 years and was at one time back in the late 30s, uh, the highest producing copper ore processing facility in the entire uh, British Empire. Quite impressive. Uh, you know, times change, however, and uh, the mine eventually closed in 1974. Uh, mill number three was essentially left to rot away at that point. Uh, many of the windows were broken. Lots of the siding was missing, so the wind and the rain constantly came into the building and uh, resulted in a lot of damage inside. Uh, as I said before, it was declared a National Historic Site. That happened in 1988, and, and that time sparked an effort to renovate the exterior to preserve the interior uh, for, for long-term use. Now, a volunteer effort uh, was organized by the museum. We began to plan for and raise funds for the complete exterior renovation and that culminated in a $5 million uh, project in 2005 that saw a new roof, uh, new side cladding, and most impressively, all 14,416 windows, which were replaced and reglazed by hand. Uh, we actually <laughs> milled all of the wood frames out of old growth lumber, sustainably sourced old growth lumber, and that was all done on site at the museum. The building uh, saw further seismic upgrades in 2012 which ensured the actual interior area itself was safe for, uh, for a show like Boom. And, and that set the stage for us to do, yeah, this, this big show with something special on the inside. Uh, helping us through all of that and, and also into the show itself is Nancy Holm. She's been our project manager for a lot of our capital projects over the years. And now I turn it over to Nancy. Yeah, so thanks, thanks Darren. So yeah, Nancy with Echo West Developments was involved in an earlier uh, uh, rehabilitation, well, earlier projects at the Mill Mine Museum and then also the rehabilitation of the building. So she's gonna tell us um, a little bit about what came next in, in developing uh, something new for the museum. Thank you, Darren. Um, there are many historical significant buildings on the site, including mill number three, of course, and most needed repair or would be lost. Um, the underground infrastructure was failing. At one time, more water was leaking in the underground, out of the underground piping than was being used above ground. In phase one, old buildings were converted to exhibit spaces and a new visitor center was built. The board members worked very hard to raise the funds needed from the mining industry and the governments. And Phase one, they, they raised $15 million for this. But there was still more work to be done. Even after raising all the funds for phase one and all the work that we did, they, we brought them back to raise more funds. And this was so the museum could build an attraction inside the mill number three. And Darren highlighted the, the points. Um, how did it operate? What was it like there up in those levels? The mill show project budget was set at a tiny budget of $3.2 million Canadian. That's 2.5 million US. But even at that substantially low budget for such an undertaking, it took three years for that amount to be raised. Again, the planning started as soon as we were well into our fundraising and the production and construction started in 2018 and boom opened in the summer of 2019. But to do this, we needed a, an experienced creative team that would fall in love with the project, just like the mine volunteers did to do the windows. The management selected Vista Collaborative Arts because they tackled challenging projects like this before. All right, Aaron. Yes. So, so at this point, we have a location, we have a budget, and we have an idea of what the experience should be about. So that's where Randall comes in. So, Randall, you're the producer and creative director for the Boom Project for your company, Vista Collaborative Arts. So, you're going to talk a bit about how you brought a team together to start filling the unique space with something sort of exciting. So, how did you approach that? Well, uh, we were invited to uh, create the main attraction in the iconic uh, mill building. Um, the museum knew about a similar project that we had created in Monterey, Mexico with similar challenges. Plus, um, over 25 years, uh, my partner, Scott Weber, 
and I have created uh, immersive storytelling experiences worldwide for museums and science centers. So we brought many of our creative partners from those projects to Britannia. Uh, and we had worked with Nancy Holm, uh, the museum's project manager on two large immersive projects, one in Italy and one in Portugal. So they knew what we could do. But um, the venue was a challenge. Um, windows flooded the space with daylight, more than 14,000 panes of glass. The 20 story building uh, leaning against the mountain had been stripped of all the machinery. Plus uh, it was a minefield of dangers prohibiting anyone from wandering about. As was mentioned, the museum gave us uh, three goals. Um, guests uh, wanted to know what it looked like up there because they could only access the bottom level. Um, we needed to, because it is a museum, we needed to explain how ore was brought in the upper level, processed, and left as copper concentrate. But most of all, we were told, create a wow experience. Britannia has a characteristic that most museums lack, and that's uh, authenticity. This is where it actually happened, and we wanted to make the mill building come alive. As the museum evolved, um, guests had been taken on a tour <clears throat> with a guide, but only on the renovated uh, bottom level. We uh, watched how guests reacted when entering the building and what they were curious about. So uh, chatty, boisterous groups suddenly switched to whispers as if they just entered a European cathedral. That space is really awesome. And it was important uh, to have each group of our guests for the new show to feel like they were the first to discover this abandoned building. Uh, guests were fascinated with the stairs, the cart, and the rail track up the side of the mountain. It had become the background for thousands of selfies. Uh, originally, a three-ton rail car uh, carrying machinery and building materials was pulled up the mountain. And it was clear that the skip track POV had to be the proscenium for our entire immersive experience. All sets uh, were designed by Tim Lindsay to mimic the abandoned look and to hide all of the presentation technology. We knew that the central effect had to be dramatic and almost overwhelming soundscape of the machines crushing and grinding rock. When the mill was operating 40 years ago, I remember driving the Sea to Sky Highway and I could hear the booming noises miles before the building appeared. The audio had to be the central experience. So we got longtime associate uh, Tim Archer, Masters Digital to create the unique soundscape. Uh, in past, uh, Tim has won several industry awards of excellence for his work on previous Vista projects. Tim also designs and produces IMAX soundtracks. Uh, and typically an IMAX theater has 10 large speakers. We have 30, all point sourced for the mill's original sound locations. And with an array of gigantic subwoofers, Tim created the gut throbbing feeling of the original industrial crushing machine. Video production. Because the building had been abandoned for 40 years, Scott Weber, the director, found that shooting on location was a safety challenge. But there were also opportunities. Uh, the space is so cavernous that Scott was able to use drone flown cameras for stunning perspectives. Our host, Jack, we cast a charismatic, engaging actor as our video host to take us on the journey. And Jack appears on a 70 inch video screen in portrait mode. And the tour itself of the 20 story building takes place on a 16 foot screen that drops down from a full rusted structural steel beam. Lighting with the uh, 14,416 panes of glass, they let in a lot of daylight, especially on a sunny day. And Doug Welsh, our uh, lighting designer, 
brought in powerful LED projectors to draw the audience attention around our enormous stage. We used theatrical foggers to simulate the ever-present dust in the air, and Doug was able to simulate the unique color of the crushed rock dust clouds. Doug's company, uh, EOS Light Media, was awarded an industry award of excellence for their creative approach to this difficult lighting venue. The immersive effects, performance solutions in Toronto created our physical effects. And so we had sparks explode from the original master electrical panel, simulated dust from the crushing of rocks fills the upper level, welding sparks cascade. Uh, pine oil was used in the flotation process for the copper. So we used a pine oil scent cannon above the audience. Uh, pneumatic pipes were programmed to burst and blow simulated dust. And the foreman's office is animated just before the dynamite blast. But for that wow experience, our biggest challenge was to resurrect the skip cart to move on the 100-year-old wooden track and to do it safely. The skip was to be a runaway rail car in our story hurtling towards our seated audience. It had to operate four times an hour, eight hours a day, every day for years. Nancy and I approached David Lowe of uh, Dynamic Attractions and explained our concept. We knew that our moving skip budget would probably not be enough to craft a safe and reliable moving cart. David agreed, but he embraced the challenge and he took our modest skip budget, then brought dynamic attractions into the project as a sponsor. All right. Uh, yeah, thanks, Randall. So obviously recreating a piece of you know, heavy antique uh, mining equipment in a convincing way that would operate safely and in uh, close range of museum visitors requires uh, a, a special set of skills. So Nancy, you worked with David Lowe of Dynamic to make this happen. So you tell us a bit about that. Sure, let's start with the original skip track. Um, the skip track was first built, just was built before the building was built and was built so it could haul materials up the 20 stories to actually build the building. Um, it was also then used to transport milling machinery up to the top and equipment and other components. It was so dangerous that no person was allowed to ride on it. If you were caught riding on it, you were fired immediately. And the bottom 20 feet of the, of the track sat in water for years and was badly rotten. Once Dynamic agreed to become a sponsor, David's first task was to answer the question, could the 100-year-old wooden rail track with major rotten places be used? Under David's direction, the museum reconstructed the lower 40 feet of the track with new concrete and steel structure. But to do that, we had to dig out the lower 40 feet. Um, the lowest level of the mill was filled with a foot of water and when it was operating. And then all that sediment encased the bottom so hard that all we could do is use pick hammers and jack hammers to remove it. The original skip cart carried steel balls up and down the mill, and many didn't make it out and ended up entombed in the bottom. David's team engineered a custom counterweight for the bottom of the track. David? Well, the, uh, the, the design of this, uh, the skip was quite a challenge. Uh, obviously, the original working skip was hauled up by a single cable and lowered down you know, by gravity. And um, you know it, it was intended to be a, a working piece of machinery, but it didn't have any braking mechanism on the cart. And um, but we are trying to simulate a runaway cart, so the moving speed required for the dramatic show finale, finale you know, cannot really be achieved by gravity alone. So we really need to um, mechanically drive the uh, the moving skip down. So there. Many uh, challenges to you know to the to the design. I think first and foremost is that we got to design a new cart uh, that can run on a hundred year old track rails, and um, the rails um, unfortunately are no longer manufactured. Uh, so 
I think the overriding sort of design requirement is really is, is the mass um, because we're running on a hundred year old track and we need to actually drive this, uh, you know, moving skip up and down. So we have to keep the weight uh, at a minimum. Uh, the other challenge is the, is the curvature of, of the track itself. So um, we had to devise a innovative uh, chain configuration so that we can control the motion of the, of the skip but also try to conform to the profile of the curve track. So our original concept was actually to modify the ex an existing mining cart um, for you know for rich you know authenticity, but this idea was quickly abandoned uh, due to the weight constraint. So we had to custom design a fold skip and using lightweight details and custom painting to achieve that authentic look. Um, the chain driven system, um, we, we have to use an oversuite mon monitoring system to, to make sure that the skip can move up and down and then can also stop at any point uh, for maximum uh, show programming flexibility. So, in order to fit the custom moving mechanism to a hundred uh, euro track, um, we also discovered, uh, you know, during inspection that some of the wood ties were also missing, and some of them were actually badly rotten. So they all had to be replaced. So we decided to custom design uh, low-profile steel ties that would tie the two rails together, provide stability, but at the same time provide, you know, adequate clearance for uh, for the moving skip. So when it comes to the mechanical um, system, um, we had to custom design a, a motor mount uh, that we can fly up, you know, be specially rigs can fly it up to the top because there's no real um, uh, space for, uh, for, for crane. Um, and then um, we have to uh, install the motor assembly um, in a very, very tight space. So there was a lot of challenge and a lot of, uh, you know, as-built measurement and uh, custom procedures uh, to get the motor up to the top. When it comes to the... Next slide, please. When it comes to testing, um, the entire system need to be rigorously tested, um, you know, cycle tested. Uh, we had an in independent inspector um, who would test the entire system <clears throat> with all possible um, simulated emergencies before it's being certified safe. Of course, uh, our first audience uh, sitting at the bottom of the track uh, was us. So, um, so it was a good thing that we did that. Nancy? Thank you. Um, as David was saying, um, the moving skip had to look like the original, but because of the weight, um, Dynamic had to engineer a brand new one. The, re the replica also had to hide all the modern technology, uh, the shock absorber, the devices that prevent the cart from lifting, and the end stop, all that had to look antique, 100 years old. And it, and it had to be always under control, even though it was very tightly engineered. So it was done, this is a building the replica with all of those kinds of components in it. And when the, when the moving skip was finally finished, it sells the abandoned look upon the entry. Um, the, the finished moving skip cart um, shows the new ties, the concrete were set dressed to look like they'd always been there. There was a full load of wooden crates and styrofoam steel balls all bolted down so they never moved. And the end stop was both a classical train design and functional to protect the guests seated at the end track as the ultimate safety stop. The set designs were also a very key component. All the sets had to look like they were part of the abandoned mill. The metal beams were painted out, and even in some case, we stressed them with acid, so they, they were already rusting. Special effects and modern technology was hidden until the story required them to be revealed, and the speakers in the lower level were all encased in wood to look like old crates. 
and new interior walls were covered with original tin and windows that we salvaged from elsewhere within the mill and the, and the museum. Darren? All right. Thanks, Nancy. So we have covered how the show was developed uh, around all these different kind of constraints we had, the existing facility, the design, the challenges, and we're ready to for visitors. So um, Randall's going to take us briefly through the show and, uh, and how a guest would experience it. Yes. Uh, 40 years ago, the mine shut down, the equipment was sold and removed, and the structure was abandoned. We wanted the audience to feel like they had entered the abandoned old mill building. Um, we amplified that a bit. We created um, a subtle music track with amplified sounds of water dripping, pigeons and bats flapping and communicating. Uh, the lighting team created mysterious shadows throughout the entry to the seating area. And uh, then we seated the audience on old CIL dynamite my cases. So act one, why was the place built? On show start, an old crate rotates and reveals our host, Jack. Jack walks us through a lively animation explaining the milling process. Basically, the ore comes in the top of the building from the mine on trains. The ore is crushed, ground, separated in stages, and leaves the building at the bottom as copper concentrate. In act two, what does it look like up there? So we get Jack to leave the monitor. He shows up on the 16 foot main screen. Then he takes us on a tour of the mill from the arrival of the ore train through each step of the process. None of the original equipment existed. So Scott had to recreate CG versions and place them all in their original locations. And these ghostly animated versions of the machines also allowed us to clearly show what was going on inside each of these machines. Jack then moves down each level, revealing each new machine, describing its function, crushing, grinding, flotation. Then in act three, what was it like to have been there when it was in full operation? Jack decides to go off script to demonstrate for us how everything sounded in the mill when it was in full operation. Mischievously, he fires up the mill from the original control panel. Instantly, things don't go as planned. Sparks fly out of the electrical panel and the skip unexpectedly starts to move on its own. After he gets all the mill's machinery running at full volume, and again, the skip spontaneously starts to move, electrical panel shorts, sparks fly out, and the skip starts to move all the way up the track again. Jack panics. He shuts off all the power to the mill, and for one self-satisfied beat, he relaxes. Then suddenly the skip plunges down the track toward the audience, and stops with a bang and a cloud of dust, simulated, of course. Here's a look and feel of the finale with the skip plunging down towards the seated audience. Darren? Okay. How about we just keep that last part between us? Okay? Okay. All right, just get the screen shared properly here again. Hopefully that video came through properly on Zoom. So yeah, so that's that's uh, the show. Um, and then there's a, a bit of an epilogue talking about uh, the, the mine town after it was, was shut down and, and a nice peaceful exit for the audience. But um, yeah, so at this point, um, thanks Randall for taking us through that. Um, we're gonna actually ask this team to share some of the lessons learned from Boom uh, and other projects from museums and nonprofits and how that might differ from theme parks or other entertainment um, 
type businesses that, that, that we might work in. So you know, Randall's been uh, creating projects for museums for over 25 years and has put together some points that, that uh, are based on what he's learned. So what I'm gonna do actually, I'm gonna post the link in the chat to the next few slides. Uh, there's a lot of information in there. We're not gonna read through every um, bit of text in there, but Randall's gonna kind of link some of the experience from Boom to the, uh, to the lessons that are available there. So again, if you're interested in these last few slides, um, there is a link to a chat in the chat to where you can download them. So Randall, take it away. Yeah, um, working with nonprofits is different from uh, corporate clients. Um, first, you have to understand your client's business. Next slide. Yep. Sorry, I was just posting that, pasting that into the chat. There we go. There we go. Okay. Um, nonprofit is not a business plan, it's a tax status. And as Darren mentioned, Britannia is a small museum that re re relies on gate admissions for 90% of their operations budget. And while they have an educational mandate, the overarching demand to us was to create a wow experience, meaning bring the people in and the revenue. That was the subtext to our central task. Second, uh, fundraising for capital projects will pr probably be uh, their only source of uh, funding for the project. Most museums fund capital projects with donations from the community. And this case, it was the mining industry and government grants. We persuaded Britannia to first fund uh, a phase so we could figure out the story, what it would look like, and a budget estimate for the immersive show. We provided them with the sizzle using concept art and a narrative that could be used to approach both industry and governments for funding. Once we completed the first phase, it took Britannia almost four years to secure enough funding for us to be able to start the production phase. And not all the funding was there when we started. Fortunately, the museum had a benefactor that guaranteed the shortfall of any, but fundraising did continue while we worked. And in the end, the committee did secure the full budget. Four, constantly educate the client to the process of creating an immersive storytelling experience. For smaller institutions, this may be the largest budget for an attraction in their history. So, Craft a decision-making schedule that clearly shows all decisions and approvals that you will need. This can be comforting to them and reassuring them that they are in charge. We also explain that uh, progress in a project like this is like a braided rope. You can't go back and make changes without unbraiding the rope, and that can be expensive. Five, insist that the client appoint a single person as the communication hub internally. <clears throat> Unlike businesses, museums have a lot of stakeholders that must be consulted to get a decision. Strongly encourage them to have a single contact to work with their decision-making tree and then report back to you. We were fortunate that this museum had their capital projects manager, Nancy, uh, she'd already completed phase one of the building of the museum, and they were used to the type of decision-making structure uh, to be able to proceed in a timely manner with this phase that we were in. Professional acknowledgement. Often institutions do not allow professional acknowledgements. Britannia had a policy uh, that does give recognition to the many companies that participated but not the individual talent. However, everyone who did work on the project could use Boom in their respective CDs. Search for ways to enhance their budget. Most museums already have relationships with local companies that can provide services free or at a discount. As we did with Dynamic, with the museum's permission, you can use the museum's positive community presence to attract new service providers or sponsors to enhance their limited budget. 
to engage a sponsor like Dynamic that is really busy with their major client projects, we made sure that our timeline was flexible so Dynamic could fit us into gaps between their projects and any downtime that they might have if needed. Plus, Dynamic negotiated significant discounts and contributions from their many suppliers and fabricators. We were able to significantly add to Britannia's budget for boom. We had our wow runaway skip cart. Set up a relationship with local tech companies. Small museums will often not have the staff experience to maintain, repair, or replace all the specialized equipment on a complex show like this. We did budget for duplicates for the brains of the show, but we looked to local suppliers for the presentation hardware. We created relationships with them so that when equipment needs repair or replacement, the local people know the show and they can provide spares overnight if necessary, so the show would never be down for very long. We train the museum's on-site staff for daily show checkouts, how to look for problems, and to be able to describe them to the local off-site techs. Something as simple as handing out family passes to selected suppliers to the show during a preview period or shortly after opening will endear them to the show and they will want to help the museum keep the show running smoothly. And finally, new technology for immersive storytelling. We all love the immersive environments created by Disney and Universal, but some museums are nervous about bringing what they perceive as theme park entertainment into their world. Fortunately, there is solid audience research to support our strategy. And as a result, Britannia was comfortable with our approach to telling their stories. They quickly grasped the principle that people having fun are more open-minded and attentive to what you're trying to teach them. And because it's fun, they will remember it longer compared to even really well-designed and well-illustrated interpretive panels. So if you're going to work with museums, a um, few of these things might help guide you. Great. Thanks for sharing that, Randall. Um, so again, there's a couple of questions in the chat. I just thought once again, uh, before we move on to that, we'll, we'll throw in a little plug that, again, on uh, August 28th, um, we're going to have a live event at the uh, Britannia Mine Museum up here in the Vancouver area. So uh, if you're able to, you know, come out, uh, you get to experience the the mine underground tour and the, the boom show itself. So look for that to be posted. Um, so just looking at a couple of the questions in, in the chat here. Um, I've got a question from Doug Bain. Actually, this might be a good one for Darren Johnston. It's about the, the mine museum itself. So question is, is the mining part of the process a part of the experience too? And is there any access to the actual mine? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a question we get all the time, even when people are there uh, on the underground tour, which is which we call Copper Quest. Um, it's obviously related thing. Everything's related to mining at the Mine Museum, but it is uh, uh, obviously a, in a different location. The, the, the tunnel, the underground actually goes underneath the mill. So if, if you're actually in there watching boom, you're actually watching the train through the rock go uh, through the uh, go underneath the mill just by coincidence. But that underground is not part of the formal mine, which is part of the ore bodies. The underground experience that uh, you know any of the members that come on August 28th that you'll be going on is a support tunnel for the mills uh, above it. And it was never part, there's no mining going on there, but it's a formal tunnel. It's blasted um, a long time ago. It's a very old tunnel. It was blasted in the early 1905, we think, something around then. We don't know exactly when it was blasted, uh, but it's a real underground tunnel, um, and it's, it's a pretty cool place uh, to be in, uh, in addition to the mill. Great. Thanks. Yeah, that's really good background. Um, question probably for Nancy. Um, so from uh, Lisa, Lisa Shanley. Uh, in the end, how much funding was private? How much was you know, benefactors and government grants? I'm not sure if you kind of even have a rough breakdown in your head um, uh, of what that might be. And how did you do with staying on budget with a really, really tight budget? 
So the, the mining industry um, has been very, very supportive of the Britannia Mine Museum. And the board has is, is got some very major mining industry uh, people. And we were, were very lucky on both phase one and phase two to have the head of the fundraising uh, committee being a very, very staunch supporter, shall we say, for Britannia Mine. And he would first off by going and twisting some of the arms of all the other mining companies and to give them some money. Once he got a little bit of seed money, we then started going after grants. And in the end, um, it was Trudeau during one of his first acts when he got in was to look at these federal um, cultural grants. And what they do with the grants is they are very key on how much is it matching? And in this case, two thirds had to come from sponsorship in some form, and, and then the federal would, would pay the one third. So it was very much a strategic um, process of getting the money agreed to, and then how do you actually claim it and get the money back? And so it was very tricky but it's become one, one of the norms that you do when you're dealing with nonprofits and you're dealing with grant money. And then my job is to watch every penny and uh, to become very, very proactive in making sure that the budgets are controlled and everybody works within their own little budget. And I I'm very lucky because I got to work with people that I know and they trust me and I trust them and in the end lots of times it was that's all the money we had do the best you can do and in some cases like dynamic they go out and they stretch the budget they got by bringing in more of their sponsors or more suppliers to do favors for them so it's a really collaborative process to make sure you're doing that but it also requires that you literally track every dollar and how it's being spent and is it being spent wisely and to make sure each group has enough money to finish their portion of the work. That's a great answer and I can I can attest that uh, Nancy's a great project manager even when, when we're developing this presentation and we get together to talk about it and she would always be the one to say okay well then that's great when is the next meeting when are we going to set a date to have this next step in when are we going to move it ahead so uh, definitely on task and, and working within the time. So I thank you for that, Nancy, and keeping us driven ahead. So one uh, maybe quick final question here, and then we'll let people go back to their uh, days, evenings, wherever you're watching from. Um, and this is kind of uh, scroll through here. Um, it's kind of an open question. Um, uh, so how did you factor upkeep of show action equipment into the project budget? Um, I might kind of say that might be a, a difference in the understanding of what is sort of the capital project budget versus an overall, an ongoing operating budget. But I'm not sure if anybody wants to kind of weigh in and... and, and I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and, and then Darren can add his point because I think he, he's got, there's two pieces to it. In the capital project, we wanted to make sure that we bought enough supplies, so uh, consumables for at least a year of, of, of use under the capital budget. We bought spare parts, we bought spare components. We had that all sort of, shall we say, in the warehouse, in the museum in case they have to replace stuff. And so there was that kind of a little bit of redundancy, but not much. And then while we were going through the whole program, um, I worked with Darren and the museum to actually work on their budget for the next year so that they could include any operational components that they they thought they might need to put in not after the show had started but get it in the budget for the next year darren yeah yeah that's that was basically correct and you know the spares are in the initial batch of consumables was was a key factor and then what that let us do is is go through the first uh, period of time uh, you know, six months a year uh, to unfortunately COVID got in the middle of that, but we, we, we weren't sure about the rate of consumable use and how much that was going to be. And so that initial purchase using the project funds of the, the spares and the consumables allowed us to plan long term uh, for, uh, you know, our, 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 should we should we use more contingency funds within the project, which, of course, Nancy set aside because that's what a good project manager does. 
uh, should we use more of that contingency to, to spend more on uh, more consumables to allow the museum a longer term flexibility. And, uh, and, and that hasn't been necessary. Thankfully, the consumable use is, is within limits of our normal operational budget. And, and so, so that was from the project management side, very valuable to us uh, for forward looking, um, you know, how much is this thing gonna cost us year to year uh, to, to put on? And, and that's how we approach that. And it's worked out quite well so far. Great. Um, maybe we'll squeak in one more question, um, just because it's from Dan Dilapena, a, a former coworker here at, at Dynamic that uh, worked on a lot of great projects for us. So I'll ask your question, Dan. Um, has there been any particular design system or control adjustments that have been made to the skip ever since the attraction opened for daily use? So any kind of adjustments, changes that, that were found you had to make, uh, tuning of the show or, or you know, mechanical or electrical changes? Any thoughts on that, Darren, or is it all just um, perfect? Yeah, I can, I can uh, uh, comment on that. Uh, there's been uh, zero problems with, with the skip. Um, it's been a remarkable portion of the show that uh, I don't think there's, there's nothing really that's gone wrong with it. And any time that something strange has happened and we're thinking that maybe it's a problem with the skip system, no, it's, it's a design on purpose to behave, it's behaving exactly as it should for the reason it was designed to behave that way. One of the problems, for example, we had was uh, we were moving some of the um, movable um, set pieces around and that was affecting how the smoke comes out of the, uh, the skip, when the skip lands at the, at the bottom. And, and it was actually setting off the intrusion sensor before the skip actually came to a halt, a designed you know, slowdown. And what it was doing is throwing on the emergency brake, uh, but the emergency brake couldn't react as fast, fast enough because it was right at the end of the movement. And so it was actually impacting the end stop just very slightly. And we couldn't figure out why. We thought it was maybe an error in the movement sequence. And no, it was behaving exactly as it should. It's just that the, because we were moving some of, some of these barrels around, it was, it was interfering with the intrusion sensor. And so it wasn't anything wrong with the skip. It was designing, uh, behaving exactly as it should. Um, and we've made no changes. We've been monitoring the skip. We've done, Nancy helped me out three um, um, scans, three uh, uh, survey scans using lasers and all that to, to check the movements of the, of the skip system, uh, you know, of the original trestle and it's fine. I think we did three. Yes. And, and, and that's all we've had to do. Other than that, it's been, it's been great. All right. Okay. Well, uh, I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, it's a good length of time. So thank you everybody who's joined us online for, uh, for this presentation. <laughs>